The way they did that was that they started from plain simple alpha helices because they're easy to insert in membranes. And then we systematically changed the competition, uh, composition here. W, tryptophan, A, alanine, L, leucine. And there is something else I'm not showing here simply because it's not really part of the helix, but the black part up here is a proline. Do you remember prolines? Prolines are strong helix breakers. So when I put the proline here, that's going to mean the end of the alpha helix. And then there will be some more coil. But still, that's important. If the helix has a clear beginning and a clear end, that's going to mean that it will not... For instance, if the helix is too short, one way to adapt that would be for the helix to become slightly longer, right? But by putting a proline at the start and a proline at the end, I ensure that the length I gave this helix is going to stay that way. It's not going to be able to extend the helix to fit better. W, tryptophan. That was that particular residue that I mentioned that really will anchor things to the head groups. So by putting a tryptophan there, I can almost force that part to stay in the head groups. I can't pull it down and I can't push it up. A and L. Alanine is a small residue. Formerly, it's a hydrophobic side chain, but it's so small that it can really go either in water or oil. L, leucine, is a longer hydrophobic side chain, but plain, simple, nothing special with it. If I introduce more leucines, more of the red parts here, I'm going to make the helix more hydrophobic. If I introduce more alanine, I will make it more hydrophilic. So by changing the A and L composition here, and also the length, I can choose A, how hydrophobic my helix is, Will I have the hydrophobic part mixed or will it be hydrophobic on one side, hydrophilic on the other? And then I can also adjust the length while ensuring things stay in the head group region. And this is roughly what Antoinette did. They looked at the length distributions of helices and that's how they saw these parts that in particular with the anchors, the tryptophans here, right? With the anchors, you can actually get helices that are surprisingly short, maybe just 12 residues long or so, to still go straight through the membrane. Normally, I would need, say, 20 residues or so for it to be stable, but this one works. It's just that it's going to distort the lipids heavily. But NMR tells us it does go straight through the membrane. At some point, when the helix starts to becoming maybe 20, 21, 22 residues, it's starting to be stretched. And when you go all the way out to 24, we can see in the NMR experiment, because we're studying ordering, that this lipid is now no longer straight, but it has tilted relative to the membrane. That's not good per se. We will distort the, the lipids more. But again, if that is the only way to keep the helix stable, so be it. And most of the simple understanding of the parts I showed you where things go were determined this way. So what if we now take that helix, but instead of drawing it the way we have it here, let's assume that I take a helix that's roughly 50% alanine and 50% leucine. But I put all the alanines on that side and all the leucines on that side. Well, to first approximation, I would have the same average composition as this helix. But my helix up here would be hyd roughly hydrophilic here and hydrophobic there. So that particular helix would actually prefer to sit this way in the bilayer, with the leucines, the hydrophobic side facing down, and the alanines, the hydrophilic side facing 